Welcome to another afternoon reading from the Mrs. Pickle Wiggle Treasury. I'm Miss Barbara from the Huntington Beach Library. Now, the Mrs. Pickle Wiggle Treasury, written by Betty MacDonald and illustrated by Hillary Knight, consists of three Mrs. Pickle Wiggle books, which we all have in our library. So, if you'd like to check them out, you can. The three books that are in the treasury are Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. That's the first one that introduces Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. The second one, Hello, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. And the third one, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's Magic. Now, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle is a cross between Nanny McPhee and Mary Poppins. She is a lady who all the children love. She's very kind and she's very inventive. All the mothers call her because she is able to think of ingenious ways to cure children of bad habits, such as not taking a bath and not going to bed. So let's find out what bad habit she is going to break today in the very beginning of Hello, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. So here it is from the book. Hello, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. We're going to start with the very first cure, and this is the show-off cure. I'm sure none of you are show-offs, but this is what Mrs. Piggle Wiggle is going to suggest. It was a beautiful morning. A bluebird sat on a small branch in a flowering cherry tree and swayed gently back and forth. A crocus pushed his golden head through the tender green grass and blinked at the sudden sunlight. Mrs. Carmody hummed as she laid slices of bacon in a black iron skillet. Spring is my favorite time of year, she said. She looked over at Mandy the dog, who was lying in the kitchen doorway, scratching a flea and waiting for someone to trip over her. Miss, Mrs. Camordi plugged in the toaster, got out the raspberry jam, and went to the front hall and called upstairs to her husband. Jordan, dear, time for breakfast, and to her little boy. Philip, where are you? Philip, who was ten years old and still under the covers of his bed, said, Oh, where am I? I'm practically dressed. And Constance, his sister, who was eleven and three quarters, yelled from the bathroom, where she was testing on lipstick to see how it looked when she was 13, said, Hey, Mom, Philip isn't even up yet. He won't be down for another 10 hours. And Philip shouted, Hey, you old spy, tattletale. And Constance said, Be quiet, little boy. You bore me. And Mrs. Carmody said louder, Philip, get up out of bed this instant. And Connie, wipe off that lipstick. And Jordan, hurry up, dear. Come down while the toast is still hot. She went back into the kitchen and gave the coffee shake gave the coffee maker a little shake to hurry it up. Then she walked over and stood by the open back door, breathing in deeply the beautiful, fragrant early morning air. Her pleasant reverie was suddenly broken when Mr. Camardi came in grumpily in the kitchen, tripped over Mandy the dog, stepped heavily into her water bowl, which spilled water all over the kitchen floor. Mrs. Carmody grabbed the sink sponge and began to wipe off the water. Mr. Carmody growled, Well, that's certainly a nice morning greeting. And Mrs. Carmody said, Oh, Jordan, dear, I'm so sorry. Did you get wet? It doesn't matter, said Mr. Carmody mournfully. Nothing matters anymore. What do you mean nothing matters anymore, said Mr. Carmody as she squeezed out the sponge. Just that said Mr. Carmody sadly, pouring almost a whole pitcher of cream into a shredder of wheat biscuits. Are you sick? And Mrs. Carmody, looking anxiously at him. No, I'm not sick, or at least not physically sick. I'm just sick at heart. Mrs. Carmody buttered the toast, put it on a plate, stirred up the eggs, lifted the bacon onto a paper towel to drain, and checked the color of the coffee, refilled Mandy's water bowl, and then said, What in the world are you talking about, Jordan? You don't make any sense. Well, he makes sense to me, said Connie, flouncing into the kitchen, because I feel the same way. I'm just so ashamed I could die. What in the world are you two talking about? said Mrs. Carmody. Are you ready for your eggs, Jordan? I suppose so, said Mr. Carmody dolefully. Quickly, Mrs. Carmody took the plates out of the cupboard, opened the eggs into four equal portions, added a dash of paprika, 
laid the four strips of bacon and two pieces of toast, carried two of the plates to the table, snapped them down in front of her husband and daughter and said, Now, tell me what this is all about. Connie picked up a piece of bacon and began nibbling at it. Well, she said, if you really want to know, Mom. Yes, said her mother. I really want to know. Well, said Connie, the point is that Philip is ruining our lives and you just won't face it. Ruining our lives? Philip, said Mrs. Carmody, don't be ridiculous. I'm not being ridiculous, said Connie. Phillips is a disgusting little show-off. I'm ashamed to bring my friends home anymore. And what about last night, Mom? He disgraced poor Daddy. Mrs. Carmody glazed, gazed at her daughter intently for a moment and said, Connie, you've got lipstick on again. Now go upstairs right now and wash that off. Oh, honestly, Mom, everybody wears lipstick at my age. Excuse me, let me go wash it off. And upstairs she went. Hurry along, dear, said her mother. When she was sure she could hear Connie's furious footsteps stomping up the stairs, she turned to her husband and said, Now, Jordan, dear, what is this all about? Mr. Carmody said, Meg, Philip is an obnoxious little show-off. Last night was the worst I've ever seen him. And... Bob Waltham, my most important client, frankly, I wouldn't blame him if he never comes back and never calls me. I could have lost a job because of our son. Oh, Jordan, said Mrs. Carmody, laughing. Philip was just trying to be amused. He was just entertaining. Do you call putting a whole baked potato in his mouth entertaining? Do you call drinking an entire glass of water without stopping and then choking and turning purple and spitting water all over the table entertaining? Do you call looking cross-eyed, touching his chin with his tongue, wiggling his ears, standing on his head, reciting the alphabet backwards and forwards, sideways and upside down entertaining? Well, I don't, and neither did my client, Bob Waltman. And there is Philip. Looks like he's, there's poor Bob Waltman, the client, and there is Philip acting like a little monkey and not being very entertaining at all. Would your parents get mad if you did something like that when company was over? Well, they might if they were entertaining clients. Now, Jordan, said Mrs. Carmody, you know that Bob Walton is a stuffy old bore. You said so yourself. And after all, Philip is only ten. He's just a little boy. You shouldn't be so hard on him. You mean he shouldn't be so hard on me, said Mr. Carmody angrily, ripping a piece of bread in half. Meg, something has to be done about that boy. Now, today. Just then, Philip came rattling down the stairs, skidded into the breakfast room, Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad, he said cheerfully. Morning, said Mr. Carmody grumpily. Good morning, Philip, dear, said his mother. Philip sat down, grabbed the sugar bowl, and began dumping sugar on his shredded biscuit wheat. Not so much sugar, honey, said his mother. Philip added two more heaping teaspoons of sugar, then dumped the rest of picture of cream on his cereal. Looking brightly, eagerly at his father, he said, Hey, Dad, want to watch me put a whole giant shredded wheat in my biscuit all at once? No, I do not, said his father. Not even if I try to whistle Dixie with it in my mouth? Sure you don't want to see that? No, said his father. Eat your breakfast, dear, said his mother, putting a fresh pitcher of cream on the table. What if I try to stop? Talking, bellowed his father. Connie had come downstairs and was standing and noticed in the doorway saying, What a repulsive little show up! My gosh, mother, can't you see just how disgusting he is? Gosh, mother, can't you see just how disgusting he is? Mimic Philip after his sister. Shoot him, mother. Kill him. Cut him up with a butcher knife, mommy. He embarrasses me in front of my ugly, stupid, giggly friends while I try to wear lipstick. Now, children, said Mrs. Carmody gently, 
Mr. Carmoni glanced around the table and said, I want absolute quiet. Gosh, Dad, what's the matter? said Philip. Are you sick or something? Yes, I am sick of something, said Mr. Carmody, jabbing a spoon into the jam jar. I'll get you an aspirin, said Philip, sliding out of his chair. I'll get two and I'll carry them all the way downstairs on my nose. Watch me. Sit still, shouted Mr. Carmody. Sit still and eat your breakfast and don't talk. Well, okay, said Philip. But you don't have to be so crabby. Be quiet, yelled his dad. Wow, his dad's in a really bad mood. If I were Philip, I'd just be quiet and wait for dad to get in a better mood. Philip gave him a reproachful look, sat down again, and began to eat his shredded wheat biscuit. Mrs. Carmoni brought her plate and Philip's from the kitchen and sat down. She looked out at the window at the ch parallel pink cherry blossoms and the clear blue sky and the flat bluebirds swaying in the branch, but she no longer felt happy. Well, yeah, everyone in her, ha in her house seems to be upset. That kind of ruins a good morning. She took a sip of coffee, which was lukewarm, and looked around the breakfast table. Philip was eating busily, but the minute she looked away, he grinned broadly and whispered, Hey, Mom, watch me balance a my cocoa cup on my forehead. You want to see me put the cup right now on my forehead? And she smiled, shook her head, and motioned for him to be quiet. Even if it's full of boiling hot cocoa, want to see if I can do it? Maybe I can bounce it on my nose. Here, watch me, Mom. Watch. What if it has a spoon in it? said his mother. Oh, what a bunch of crab apples, said Philip. Quiet, shouted his father. Philip reached for the jam dish and began sulkily emptying it onto his plate. When breakfast was finally over and everyone had left for work or school, Mrs. Carmoni heated up the coffee and poured herself a cup, sat down at the table and looked at the morning paper. Just as she opened the paper, the corner of her eye caught a glimpse of something white on the floor under Philip's chair. She reached over and picked up a small folded piece of paper. She opened it up, smoothed it out, and it read, Dear Mrs. Kamodi, I am having a little difficulty with Philip. I wonder who wrote the note. Will you please call me at your earliest convenience? Sincerely, Edith Periwinkle. Mrs. Carmody looked at her watch. It was four minutes to nine. Perhaps she could get Mrs. Periwinkle before the bell rang. She hurried into the hall and dialed the number. When Mrs. Periwinkle heard Mrs. Carmody's anxious, worried voice, she said, Well, I didn't intend to worry you, Mrs. Carmody. It isn't anything serious. It's just that, well, well, your son, Philip, has become quite, quite the show-off, said Mrs. Carmody. Well, yes said Miss Periwinkle. I guess that's the right word. I also must admit that he's very entertaining and his schoolmates think he's very funny and laugh at everything he does. Unfortunately, he no longer confines his antics to recess and the schoolyard, so I have to take steps. This is why I'm calling you. He just won't sit still during class. When I try to teach, all he does is interrupt and make funny faces and tell jokes and takes everyone attention away from me. Is becoming very, very disruptive. Well, said Mrs. Carmody, I'm so sorry to hear that. Do you have any suggestions on what I can do? Well, said Miss Periwinkle, I do have one. Someone you can call, I think. All right. Faithful readers who have been following me. Who should she call? Should she call the Ghostbusters? No. We know who it is. Who do you think Miss Periwinkle is going to recommend? She's going to recommend Mrs. Pigglewiggle. Mrs. Pigglewiggle, said per Mrs. Periwinkle. Why, she's just a very nice little old woman who loves and understands children and has a very magical way of curing their bad habits. Here's her phone number. Just a minute, 
said Philip's mother. Why well, go get a pencil? Of course, she couldn't find a pencil, but she did finally find a broken green piece of crayon, which she wrote down Mrs. Piggle Wiggle's telephone number right on the back of the gas bill. Mrs. Carmody's hand was shaking, but she dialed the number. But Mrs. Piggle Wiggle had such a warm, friendly voice that Mrs. Carmody got right over her nervousness and told her all about her son, Philip. And Mrs. Piggle Wiggle laughed and said, Oh, isn't it a shame that children can't all just get evened up? I mean, some are show-offs and some are shy and some are quiet and some are noisy and some laugh too much and some cry too much. Oh, I could go on and on, but loud or quiet, shy or show, show-offy or timid or boisterous, children are wonderful and I love them all. Well, so do I, said Philip's mother, and actually Mrs. Piggle Wiggle Philip's showing off doesn't bother me, but his daddy says he's obnoxious and his sister Connie says he's disgusting and this morning his teacher, dear Miss Periwinkle, called and told me that he's getting out of hand. Well, said Mrs. Pigglewiggle, if it were only his older sister who complained about Philip, I would be inclined to let things work themselves out. But as long as Philip is annoying his daddy and his teacher... Miss Periwinkle is one of the best fifth grade teachers in the county. Well, I think we better take steps. Take steps, said Philip's mother. What do you mean by steps? Oh, my, it's very simple, said Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. Have Philip come down after school and I'll give him a bottle of show-off powder. For the next few days, when you're having company and just before he leaves for school in the morning, I'm sure you won't have any trouble. Just sprinkle the show-off powder on him before meals, especially when you have company and before he leaves for school. But, but what is show-off powder? asked Mrs. Carmody fearfully. Show-off powder is guaranteed to be harmless, said Mrs. Piggle Wiggle, but it will stop showing off. You see, it makes the show-off invisible. Simple, said Philip's mother. You mean I won't be able to see my own little boy? Not when he's showing off, said Mrs. Piggle Wiggle, matter of factly. Nobody will be able to see him. But when he stops showing off and is normal, he'll come back into focus. Are you sure? asked Philip's mother. Oh my, yes, said Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. Now don't worry about it. Just send Philip up after school. I know everything is going to be fine. Goodbye and please don't worry. All right, would you like to have show off powder, something that you sprinkle on yourself, but when you show off, you become invisible? I don't know. It sounds kind of interesting to me. Let's find out if it works. But Mrs. Carmody, Philip's mother, did worry. She worried as she washed the breakfast dishes, tidied up the house. She worried as she made out the grocery list and sorted out the laundry. But she worried the most when she was straightening up Philip's room. Oh, my goodness. What if the powder makes Philip disappear and something goes wrong and he doesn't come back? And she sobbed. She took two apple cores, three funny books, a slingshot, and an empty box of Smith Brothers cough drops from out from under Philip's pillow. Philip's room was so messy that she was in there for a long time, picking up and imagining terrible, awful things that she decided not to send for the magic show-off powder. That old powder was far too dangerous to use on a sensitive, intelligent little boy like Philip. And anyway, Philip's showing off was really very clever, and maybe someday he'd be up on stage. And then the front door opened, and a loud voice called, Hey, Mom! Mom, where are you? Philip was back home from school. Mrs. Carmody rushed downstairs, and sure enough, there was Philip, very much alive and visible and sitting on the kitchen table, wolfing down gingerbread and milk. His back was towards his mother, but you could see one sleeve was ripped off out of his sweater. Philip, dear, what in the world happened to your sweater? I fell off my bike, said Philip, through a mouthful of gingerbread. Oh, sweetheart, said his mother. Did you hurt yourself? Ah, not much. Kind of tore my pants, though, and ripped one of my new school shoes. See? He showed out one leg and showed his mother a pants leg ripped jaggedly up to the near knee. And he held out the other and showed his brown Oxford with a big tear in the insect. He also had a cut over his eye, a skin patch on his nose, and blood on his chin. Oh, 
Philip, said his mother, you might have been killed. Were you hit by a car? Uh-uh, said Philip. Did some big nasty boy push you? Gosh, no, Mom, said Philip. Well, what happened? asked his mother. Ah, uh, nothing, said Philip, and he drained his glass of milk. Can I have another piece of gingerbread, Mom? Certainly, said his mother, but I want to know about that accident and your bicycle. Well, said Philip, if you really want to know, I was sitting on the basket of my bike riding down Mission Hill backwards singing Polly Waddle Doodle, and I saw a bread truck coming, and I guess I didn't turn fast enough, and I ran into the Wallace's iron fence, and I caught my shoe on the pedal, my pants on the picket, and I hit my eye on the handlebars, and I don't know what else happened. But boy, you should have heard the kids laughing at that old bread man laugh, too. No doubt, said his mother. Now you go upstairs and chain your trousers and your shoes and bring your trousers to men. Take the torn shoe down to Mr. Risman and ask him if he can fix it. And on your way home, stop by Mrs. Piggle Wiggles. She has something for me. Do you know where Mrs. Piggle Wiggle lives? Why, sure I do said Philip. We play down there all the time. What's she got for you, Mom? Oh, never you mind, said his mother. Just don't forget to stop there. Now scoot. A little after 5.30, Mrs. Cromarty happened to look out the window and saw Philip coming down the driveway, followed by a crowd of children. On his head, he was carrying a shoe. Bouncing on the toe of the shoe was a small jar. Sitting on the jar was a little green frog. There he is, showing off again. That's well, a good way to get hurt, and it's also a good way to break stuff. Hopefully he doesn't break the jar of show-off powder. When Pillips saw his mother's face at the window, he called up, Hey, Mom, look at me! Watch me! I'm going to jump over the wheelbarrow with all this stuff on my head! Philip, don't! cried his mother. But it was too late. He couldn't hear her. And she watched horrified as he made a run for the wheelbarrow, caught his foot in the garden hose, fell backward onto the bush. The small jar from Mrs. Piggle Wiggles flew up in the air, landed on the concrete with a crash. Mrs. Camorty ran out, knelt down, and began picking up little pieces of broken glass out of the white powder. Having got himself out of the bush, Philip said, Gee, Mom, sorry I busted it. I didn't mean to. Don't talk, said his mother briskly. Go in and get a clean white envelope out of my desk and get the spatula off the stove. Hurry, I'm going to clean up this powder. While Philip was gone, Mrs. Carmody carefully pushed the white powder into a little mound and held her hand over it to keep the wind from blowing it away. When Philip brought out the envelope to her and the spatula, she scooped up all the powder into the envelope, all but about half a teaspoon. This she carefully lifted into the palm of her hand and blew it at Philip. Hey, what's the big idea? What do you think you're doing? He said, something very wise and maybe something I should have done a lot sooner, said his mother. Just then, Mr. Carmoni's car turned into the driveway. Immediately, Philip jumped up into a car, into a wheelbarrow and said, Hey, Dad, watch me. I'm going to stand on my head in this here wheelbarrow. I'm going to stand on my head and say the alphabet backwards. Mrs. Carmody looked at the wheelbarrow, but it was empty. There was nobody there. Oh, it looks like the powder works. Wow, it does turn you invisible when you try to show off. Not only did she not see anybody, she couldn't hear anybody either. Mr. Carmoni got out of the car and said, Wait, wasn't Philip here just a moment ago? Why, yes he was, said Mr. Carmoni, smiling a secret smile. Well, I wanted to put that hose and that wheelbarrow back in the garage. I'll tell him, said Mrs. Carmoni. He should be back in a minute or so. She and Mr. Carmoni went into the house and closed the kitchen door. Philip, quite red in the face, from standing on his head in the wheelbarrow and horse from reciting the alphabet backwards and forwards called out to them, Hey, Mom, Dad, look at me! But they didn't even glance at him. Hey, you kids, you kids over there, look at me! He called out to the children who had followed him home from Mrs. Pickle Wiggle's house. But nobody answered. 
They just turned around and walked away. Slowly, he righted himself, climbed out of the wheelbarrow, and went into the kitchen. How come you and Dad didn't watch my trick? He asked his mother, who was busy at the stove. She said, We didn't see you doing any tricks. Now go and put the hose and wheelbarrow away and sweep up all that broken glass. Dinner will be ready in about five minutes, and it's your favorite. You mean frankfurters and baked beans and brown bread? Philip asked. That's right, said his mother. Ha, diggity dog, said Philip. Reaching around the broom closet, his mother took out a broom and a dustpan and handed them to him. All right, here you go. Now sweep up the glass first. Philip took the broom, held it over his shoulders, and began making a zooming noise. Hey, Mom! Hey, Mom! Look at me! Watch me! I'm a jet plane! Here I go! Ready for takeoff! And as soon as he started to shout, watch at me, he began to disappear. And with takeoff, he was gone. Humming contently, his mother took the lid off the steamer and poked at the brown bread. At dinner time, he disappeared three times. The first time, when he turned his chair around, crouched down on the rear seat and said, Hey, look at me! I'm a big gorilla in a cage! Toss me a banana, somebody! He disappeared right after toss me. Mr. Camoni almost jumped out of his chair. Meg! Meg! The boy's gone! There must be a trap door under the chair! Oh, don't get hysterical, Jordan, said Mrs. Carmody. He'll be back. And he was in about two minutes. The next morning, after he was dressed, Philip climbed on the banister and yelled at Connie. Hey, Connie! Look it! I'm sliding down the banister! Forwards and backwards! And then he disappeared and didn't come back into focus until everybody had finished the breakfast and his poached eggs were quite cold. His mother noticed he had a large purple bump over his left eye. And as he slid into his chair, Philip said, Nobody in the whole darn family cares what happens to me. My whole skull's probably cracked, but the lot of you don't care. Quiet, roared Mr. Carmody. Mrs. Carmody said, Eat your eggs, dear. It's getting late. And as she spoke to him, she leaned over and sprinkled some show-off powder on his hair. Turning around and giving her a suspicious look, said, what you doing, Mom? Just smoothing down your hair, said his mother. During geography, while Miss Periwinkle was standing with her back to the class, drawing a map on the blackboard, Philip stood up in his seat, wiggled his ears, looked cross-eyed, looked, cross looked like an ape, and scratched himself, making all sure that everyone could see him making tricks known for making his classmates giggle. Except, this time... Nobody was laughing. In fact, nobody looked at him at all because he wasn't there no matter how loud or how he said, Oh, 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 I'm a monkey, look at me! Oh, 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 I'm a monkey! Nobody could see him. Nobody could hear him. During recess, he put a whole package of bubble gum in his mouth and blew a bubble bigger than his head. And even though all the children were right around him, nobody pointed or laughed or said anything because... Of course, they couldn't see him. And then the bubble burst and got in Philip's hair and got his face all gummy. And then the children laughed because he was back in focus again. And there he is, blowing a bubble the size of his head. And they can't see him, but after it pops and gets all stuck in his hair, then they can see him. That doesn't sound like much fun. But Philip didn't think it was funny at all, especially when the school nurse rubbed his face and neck and head with Byzantine, which burned, trying to get the bubble gum and cutting his hair to get the bubble gum out of his hair. After school, he didn't feel very funny. His head hurt and so did his elbow, so he rode his bike home sitting in the seat the ordinary way. Bobby Westover and Billy Markle rode beside him, and they talked quite solemnly about baseball, except once when Billy rode fast down Mission Hill with no hands yelling, Help! Help! I'm out of control! My engine's conked out! My landing gear's stuck! Call the crash crew! Bobby and Philip laughed like anything until Mrs. Allen backed out of her garage and almost hit Billy, who couldn't stop and ran into a tree. Mrs. Allen turned pure white and shook and was very mad. She said, Billy Markle, I'm going to call your mother up and tell her what a little show-off you are. You almost got killed, and you 
almost wrecked my car and you practically give me a nervous breakdown. Billy, who was crying, said, Well, look at me. My shirt's torn, my nose is bleeding, and my bike's wrecked. And Mrs. Allen said, Go to the kitchen. I'll fix you right up, but don't bleed on my clean linoleum. Bobby and Philip said goodbye to Billy, but he didn't hear them. As they rode down the corner to Philip's house, said, Poor dumb Billy. What a show-off. Sure glad I'm not one. Well, it looks like the show-off cure work. Maybe Billy will be getting it next week. This is from Hello Mrs. Piggle Wiggle from the Mrs. Piggle Wiggle Treasury. My next story I'll be reading will be <gasps> The Crybaby Cure. So tune in next Saturday. Uh, videos are posted live every Saturday at 3 and they're also on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed one, you can always go back and see them again. And of course, they count for our summer reading program, which is Dig Deeper, Read, Investigate, Discover. So make sure you join our reading program at hbpl.beanstack.com. This is Miss Barbara signing off. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe.